Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, great to see you here for this very uh, exciting conversation this afternoon. I'm Ken Foster. I'm the executive director here at YBCA. This is the fourth in a series of six conversations that we're doing around issues and ideas that uh, emanate from the Bay Area from, with a certain degree of innovation and creativity. And our, our thesis was that these ideas start here and then go across the country and across the world and uh, impact that make change all, all across the world. And we wanted to focus in on what these uh, particular ideas were and get some of the people who are really involved in them and have them participate in a conversation with artists who have been selected to participate in our triennial, triennial exhibition Bay Area Now, in which we uh, um, curate performance, film, and visual arts and try to get something of a picture of some of the most interesting and amazing stuff that's happening in the Bay Area. And what we thought was that these two fields, artists and these other fields, aren't always in conversation, and we wanted to put them in conversation. So that's why the structure is set up the way it is, in which we have the artists from the, from the exhibition and from the performances that are in the sitting in the center. We're asking you to um, observe, and there will be a, a moment to participate at some point eventually. But really, the idea is here is to put artists in dialogue um, with other creative folks. Um, and just personally, one of the reasons I'm very excited about doing that is that artists are often on the margins of those conversations. And we don't want them in the margins. We can't afford to have artists on the margins. We need to have them in the center of the conversation. So that's why we're here, and that's what we're doing. So today, Radical Identities, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, uh, Director of Community Engagement, Joel Tan, who has organized today's presentation, and he's going to lay out for you what's going to happen. So, Joel. Maraming salama. First, thank you all for being here on such a beautiful Saturday. We hope that this will be uh, a lovely thing to be at, and I think it will be. Um, and I also wanted to bring your attention to the screen, which is really a portal to uh, Second Life, where we um, are also joined by Second Life participants in avatar forms, um, along with our uh, first uh, part panelists. But before I get into that, I wanted to talk about uh, the customizable body, the present future of radical identities, and say ultimately that first, I know I'm going, all right, it's technology. It's true, I'm, I'm such a Neanderthal like that. But it's true, the Bay Area is the inspiration. And I really believe that this is the place, the, the, the laboratory of lifestyles, the petri dish of radical identities, we're it. We are it. From decompressing burners to uh, medical marijuana millionaires to dot commers to Black Panthers to Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, we are fertile. So with that, at the heart of that is identity and one's sense of self. And I wanted to <clears throat> pull together uh, when I was thinking about this is what is the present future of radical identity given everything that's come out of here, all the movements. So firstly, look at gender and sexuality. Uh, and as a Gen Xer, I, I'm, I feel like I'm a queer 1.0. Like we were the generation that went from gay to queer, right, in the, in the evolutionary line. That's who we were and now it's gone from queer to post-queer to gender queer and at this point, it's interesting how it's happening in language, but also in our daily lives. Then I'm also looking at identity in terms of the identities I inhabit um, outside of my body, who I am in my email form, who I am in my Facebook form, who I am when I get on OkCupid, when I try to sign on to Second Life. Those are all the various electronic selves um, that are out there. And so I just think to myself, what a wonderful time to be alive. And so this is ultimately a discussion that focuses on who we are with respect to gender and technology in the present and the future. So first up, this is gonna be in three parts. First up, we're gonna explore technology. Second part, we're gonna explore gender and sexuality. And third part is the best part where we all talk. We all talk about it. And we'll have two questions that we can start with, but you will be joined by our amazing panelists, but we'll 
give you more instructions then, but for now, it'll be the first two parts, which are presentations. So first up is um, our focus on technology and what it means to be virtually human. And joining us is Professor Tom Belsdorf, um, professor of anthropology at UC Irvine and author of Coming of Age and Second Life, an anthropologist explores the virtually human. He'll be, in, he'll be in dialogue with Philip Rosedale, the creator of the paradigm shifting virtual world Second Life. And we are also, just a reminder, joined by our Second Life audiences who will also be joining us in a group conversation and will be directing questions as well. So this will be a grand experiment because we'll also see how you want to, to engage with our, our neighbors on this side of the screen. So with that, let me just give this to you. Oh wait, you don't need it. So should I just go ahead and start? Oh, I thought I was waiting for the thing. Sorry about that, people. Okay. Hopefully you all can hear me in Second Life as well. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me and, and uh, allowing us to have this time together. So um, I'm Tom Belstorff, and I am sort of trying to walk and pat my head at the same time because I am the virtual cameraman to ch show us around inside of Second Life. And also, I'm here, uh, Philip and I are here to talk about Second Life and about questions of identity and gender and virtual worlds and all that kind of stuff. So as we're talking back and forth, just a, a warning, this is me on the left here, uh, for the moment looking like a, a person wearing a red sweater, that may change. And here's Philip, so we're logged into Second Life. <laughs> and yes, um, Philip has his trademark, very, very awesome um, cod piece and uh, t-shirt, so he's looking very hot there. And then here we've got a group of people who are in Second Life. They could be some people sitting in this audience, they could be in Japan, they could be in Germany, they could be in Nebraska, they could be anywhere, but right now they're in Second Life and they're here to participate in the conversation as well. And to mix it up even more, you can see them through my computer, but they can see you thanks to Chris here and his webcam. You all are getting streamed up here on these screens. So right now you see Philip and I there on those screens. And occasionally Chris will pan around so that they can see you um, in the room as well. So we're trying to create a kind of mixed reality, multiple virtual physical reality event here that I've actually never done before. Um, but so far, it's gone well. If for some reason the computer crashes, I'll just log right back on. Um, <clears throat> so um, maybe to start, I can just make one quick statement. And then it, one reason I was so excited to do this is that, is that Philip Rosedale, who is the, the founder of Second Life, is here with me. And I've never met him before today. So this is completely awesome for me to be able to, to meet him and, and that we're going to have some time to talk. Um, so just as a quick thing to get it started, I'm an anthropologist who's done research in Indonesia for many years, and when I started studying Second Life um, about seven years ago, I, I had been studying queer Indonesians and still do transgender, gay, lesbian Indonesians. I wanted to try and study the, these virtual worlds to see what was happening inside of them. So I've tried to use the same methods that I used in Indonesia, but inside of Second Life. So some of these people are friends I've known for years you're seeing here in Second Life. Some are people I've never met before that I would interview, hang out with, just like I do with people that I study in Indonesia. And I've learned so much from this, but one point that I'll make just to start off the discussion, I, because I study queer stuff and, and gender, I sort of went in at first really interested in identity and the body, and that's the topic for today, and that's really important. But I think the biggest thing possibly that I learned from doing my research was that I had the wrong focus. That the number one thing about virtual worlds, really, is that they are places. And that embodiment is always emplacement, emplacement in a world, whether that be the world here or the world inside of Second Life. And even setting up this event today, even the way that Joel was talking about the relationship between the Bay Area and radical ideas of identity, you see right there how ideas about the body and ideas about place, like the Bay Area, shape that, uh, those ideas about the body. And I did my PhD at Stanford. I've lived here for many, many years. I did my bachelor's at Stanford. I know the Bay Area very well, even though I now live in Southern California. And um, 
I think one of the most powerful things I learned from spending a lot of time in Second Life was that the body is always about the body in a place, and that different kinds of places affect the way that we think about our bodies. And that was something very profound that it took a while for it to dawn on me. Um, I should have known because I was flying to Indonesia to study queer Indonesians, and that was shaping what I was seeing. I should have known it. But it was really only after going into Second Life that I began to appreciate that what Philip and, and the people who have worked with Philip over the years have really done is to create a world. Right? I think Philip before has talked about like creating a country, and that's very profound because it is about bodies, but it's about bodies in places. And I'm still tripping out and thinking about what do these new kinds of places have in terms of possibilities and perils for our bodies here in the physical world, and, but also in the virtual world as well. So I'll just throw that out as something that just still trips me out and I think is a really interesting issue. And then I, I can't wait to hear more from Philip because I'm just so excited to meet him. Sorry if I sound like a, like a fanboy or something, but, but I am. So, so anyway, thanks to everyone who made this possible. And so I, I'm going to be moving the camera around a little bit so this doesn't get too static. So forgive me if, I, if there's a pause before I answer, but I'll, I'll try and let you see uh, more folks around here in the virtual room. Yeah, this is great. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, it's, it's fun. I mean, Tom, you, how long did you spend in total from beginning to end? And then how many hours do you think you spent in Second Life while you were doing your research and working on your I, book? I will not answer the number of hours, but, uh, but, I, I, I did, but it was two years <laughs> of full-on field work. So two yeah. years of spending a lot of time um, inside of Second Life. And it is amazing to think for those who don't know, how many people here like really don't know, you know, little or nothing about Second Life. It's okay. So for those in the audience, so that's like half of everybody here. Cool. Um, yeah, Second Life's about a million people using it today, and it's still small um, uh, and actually hasn't grown a lot over the last couple of years. As, um, uh, so it's, it's still a small community, and I think, you know, part of the discussion is the fascinating reasons behind um, why that is. It's, it's, it's a very different, challenging uh, fascinating, empowering place. Uh, it's amazing for me to be back in. I, I just want to say hi to everybody in Second Life. I have not logged in, as people in the audience there probably know. Um, in months, I have been busy working on a new company, and so it's moving to, uh, I don't know, just to see myself res in, uh, you know, in a big audience, which I have not done in so long, and it's so fun. But it is amazing to think, too, that Tom and I have never met in, in real life, in RL, uh, we have, we have perhaps met briefly in, in Second Life uh, mm -hmm. during Tom's work, but it's just fascinating to, to realize that the, the magic of virtual worlds is that to some extent, and certainly to the extent that you need for the context of research like yours, you don't need to meet in real life. And, and we have so many people, many people who work for Linden Lab, the company that, uh, that I started that, that built Second Life, that also uh, from, for years and years I never met. Some of the most amazing people in Second Life, one of my most, some of my most amazing remembered moments have been when in real life I met, you know, someone who I knew very, very well from Second Life, perhaps someone who I had been interviewed on stage with or, or you know, had, had spent hours and hours with in the world, and then you meet them in reality, and that's such a fascinating experience. Tom, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you, I wanted to sort of immediately personalize the, the discussion of avatar identity and the world, as you said, being part of that. So you got in world to start your research. So tell us about Tom Bukowski, who's sitting up there on stage in a red sweater. And who's, who is Tom Bukowski, and, and how does he differ from you? And also, I want to know, how did you furnish your house? Tell me about the space you created <coughs> around yourself, because you had an, an island, right, that was well, the center I, of your research. Well, I still have my house in Second Life. And as you can see on the um, screen, my, my red sweater self is starting to destabilize. Uh, so, you know, one interesting thing about avatar identity is that it can change, and you can change it at the drop of a hat and change your gender or become a dog or a ball of light or anything that you uh, want to do. But, um, you know, learning a new culture is always a fascinating process. And when I went into Second Life, I built a house, which I still have um, in Second Life. I learned how to clothe an avatar and put clothes on them and, and, and change their look. And um, it was learning a new culture. I mean, it was really learning something new, and that was fascinating to me, was to have, learn about what the possibilities would be. Have you, and yet most of us, as you can see in the Second Life audience, most of us do choose to be very human, and, um, and in many ways more, more human of the present time or of the present world than anything else, wouldn't you say? Well, my, you know, we can, as we're talking about this, I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of the... Uh, 
avatars in the audience might start changing their looks as well, just so you can see. <laughs> but, you know, in, in, often people in Second Life will have a main look, a default look, and then they'll have other looks they might put on for a party or doing something. Sometimes people, most of the time, have a very different embodiment than they would ever have in the physical world. But to me, a, a really interesting thing that I learned from virtual worlds that I think links up to the questions that Joel was posing about radical identity is that we often don't know what is radical or what isn't. And in my research in Second Life, I became very interested in the banal and the boring and people who look like an average person or who have a house who looks like a regular house. At first glance, it doesn't appear radical, but there's something very powerfully radical in doing that in a virtual world because what it does is it destabilizes the physical world and helps us realize how this room is powerfully virtual in so many ways. I'm speaking a language that is virtual. I cannot touch it, right? Humans have been virtual from the very beginning. Um, being virtual is part of what we are as people. And in many ways, what a virtual world like Second Life does in a weird way is almost bring us home to realize ways in which our being always is virtual. Our gender is always virtual, even sitting in a physical world space. And so I've come to appreciate the funkiness and the radicalness, even of things that don't appear, you know, like, like here we have someone who appears as a skeleton. Now that's probably not a look I would have in the physical world. You know, I probably wouldn't have this one giant eye, but even someone who looks like this, there's something very powerful happening in the ability of someone to even look like that in a virtual world. So this, this issue of, of how much do people change themselves is something that I'm very, and still very interested in, about how we decide if something is radical or not. Was there anything you learned about yourself from your avatar? I learned not so much directly from my avatar, but I learned a lot from Second Life itself as a world. For instance, I won't go to my house in Second Life right now because we have an audience here and I don't want to uh, move away from it. But I discovered that I loved building. It's like living inside of Legos. I kept tearing down and rebuilding my house. I still do it in Second Life and everyone keeps saying, Tom, my God, I come to your damn house and now it's like this totally different house. And I never had time to become an architect or the talent to do that in the physical world. And I didn't plan on doing that when I did the research, but I found out that I love building. And I learned, I mean, I just never knew that because I, I can't be an architect in the physical world. And Second Life allowed me to realize that there's this joy in building something and having people look at it and enjoy it and, and see this space. And so once again, for me, yeah. the world, the, uh, building a house became a kind of body. I mean, it was, it's, it's bits and bytes just like the avatar body. This room is also bits and bytes and the house was a piece of me and that people loved it and I could redo it. It was like changing my avatar was changing my house. So the, the, yeah. the ability to make, to enjoy building and, and nowadays architects are doing some very cutting edge, interesting work in Second Life. Builders are doing very interesting things inside of these virtual spaces. Yeah, it's amazing. There was a, there was a moment uh, early in Second Life's history, a board meeting in 2001 where we didn't ourselves know exactly what Second Life would be for. I was building it just as a, a dream. I mean, I'd always wanted to build this, this playground of Lego pieces in a way, but, but, but still I think we as the designers of it were constrained by what software and what the, what the real world was like and what software uh, games at that time were like. So we didn't really know how we ourselves would be affected by it and use it. And I remember this board meeting where we showed off all this game-like stuff that you could kind of do in the earliest version of Second Life, like shooting each other and run, chasing each other around and kind of doing stuff that was sort of vaguely computer game-ish. And then we stopped and we went to the financials to talk about the financials of the company, but I asked everybody, I said, well, just leave the screen up because we had a big screen up in the boardroom or the, the room we were having our board meeting in. We had a big projection screen, and you could see all the seven of us or so that worked at the company at that point standing outside or in Second Life, just kind of standing around as avatars goofing off because we had been done with this demonstration. And I told everybody, I said, why don't you guys just build some weird stuff while we're talking about the financials, kind of as a backdrop, like just st keep doing that. And we did that, and when we were going through the financials, we all realized we were riveted to the sight of all this kind of madcap, playful building. Like somebody built a snowman, and then somebody else on the team built a bunch of little snowmen worshiping the big snowman. <laughs> and we're all just sitting there doing these financials and watching this, and we're, we're just like, more and more like, this is just so unbelievably cool, you know, that these guys are, and it was like seven guys, they're just sitting there riffing on all these different ideas. And so we were, we were struck at that moment that that word building would be 
more than anything else core to the whole meaning of second life and, and, and perhaps to the meaning of some of our human aspirations. I mean, I think San Francisco, like you said, the, the space informs who you are. You know, San Francisco is a place of experimentation and building, and so I guess, I guess it's no surprise that, uh, that I'm here and that Second Life came out of here. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even it's so, I mean, for me, it's a treat to hear about these stories of the early days I was mentioning to Chris. <clears throat> something that I often tell audiences when we're thinking about these relationships of technology to the body and to the world is that, um, you know, right now, like one of the hottest technologies out there is Twitter, right? Twitter is a very popular thing, which you all know. You type the 140 characters and then you sort of type back and forth with people. There's no reason we couldn't have had Twitter back in 1995 with an old 2,400 baud modem and an old IBM 386 computer or something. It's actually very simple, right? It's just little lines of text. There's no technical reason we couldn't have had it 10 years ago. The reason that we did not have Twitter in 1995 or even in 2000 was not a failure of technology. It was a failure of imagination, right? We did not yet realize what was possible with these new technologies. So we were just doing old things with the new technology. We didn't yet realize what was possible. And I think for virtual worlds, virtual worlds like Second Life in 2011 are very much like the web in 1995, that we still don't realize what would be, po what would be possible with virtual worlds. So still to this day, I have people say, oh, people in Second Life must be losers. They must not have a real life. They don't have anything better to do, right? And I actually remember in the early days of the internet, why would you go online? What would you do there, right? <laughs> Why would you do that? You know, you would meet someone to date online? My God, you're going to meet an axe murderer. What's wrong with you? And now it's, what, 20% of all relationships begin online. And so hmm. to me as an anthropologist, I'm very interested in this question of imagination, and, and I'm very interested in sort of tracking as these online spaces grow and change, and we get different kinds of them. They get used in education. They get used in entertainment. Um, what are some new possibilities for the human journey that are going to come out of this? That could be good or bad. Technology is neutral. That could be good or bad. But I'm very interested in what these potential things might be because I really don't think we know yet. How do you think, Tom, the, the, the concept of avatar as sort of a secret or an alternate life differs from that, the, that, the things that we can do in the real world? I mean, in the real world, we have options for being someone else for a period of time, right? We, we can step outside ourselves in different ways. I mean, from... I mean, how would you contrast what we can do in the real world to what we do as what we can in some ways more easily do as avatars? Well, this is actually a good question sort of put back at you as well, because you can imagine a virtual world, and there are some examples of this that are almost like a Facebook setup where I would be Tom Belstorff in Second Life, and there would not be that sense of being able to have an alternative identity. Virtual worlds do not require an alternative identity. The technology right. of the platform of a virtual world does not require the, uh, the idea of role-playing or alternative identity. And you, <laughs> and, your, you know, and, and, and your group, when you were creating Second Life, made the decision to not allow people... When I joined Second Life, I chose a name, Tom Bukowski, because you would pick your last name from a list, as you still do, but that list did not include Belstorff, right? You couldn't make up your own last name. You had yeah. to have an alternative identity. That was required. And I think that's awesome and interesting. And many virtual worlds have that, but it's not a requirement of, the, of a virtual world for it to do that. And so I think I would put that question back to you and say, you know, in the beginning, and, and now there, there's actually more potential, there's more cases where people are using Second Life in a way that their physical world name is, is visible. Um, right. But what were you thinking when you started Second Life? What motivated you to make that decision in terms of the platform to disallow people to have their physical world name? What were you, the possibilities or the motivations of you for doing that? Well, I always thought about Second Life as something new, not utilitarian for the real world. I mean, we, we didn't start with the idea that it would somehow help us live our real lives better. I was fascinated by the sort of plowing the dark aspect of Second Life, to use the name of a, a great novel, actually, a, a bit about virtual worlds. The, the, it was that I, I wanted to see what things would be like if we could start over again and, and you know, recreate ourselves and the world around us entirely new and, a, and take, taking advantage of the fact that technology would m most easily allow us to do that. So in my mind, we were all kind of settlers of that space and, and therefore yeah, the idea that you, you would have a different name. You know, there, 
businesses start, you know, people are, we're not so smart as we think we are. Um, in retrospect, every entrepreneur tells you some fabulous story about how every fantastic thing in Second Life was all part <laughs> of my original vision. I knew, you know, that, that's just not true. Um, part of the names not being real names in Second Life was I just thought we were just kind of stumbling. We, we knew that everybody would pick real life names and then they'd have conflicts over them and people would sue us because somebody would be Brad Pitt and somebody else would be Angelina Jolie and then we get calls from those people. Uh, part of the naming thing was just we were trying to come up with a convenient way to get you in. I, I remember I was really passionate about double names though because they're very human. Uh, I've, I've always hated display names like, you know, Philip1732. I, I find that not at all charming. Uh, and I'm an engineer. I mean, that's my background. I, but I just, I've always hated that. So I wanted to have like Philip like Rosedale or Philip Bukowski or whatever. So I love the idea of the double name scheme uh, instead of having to do this name with extensions. And we wanted the names to be unique, at least in some sense. So, and then this whole issue of display names and unique names is a fascinating one. But long story short, we started with the idea of a projected identity, which was in some sense at least alternative or secondary to your own. And if you wanted to tie it back to your real identity, great. There's a million ways to do that. Why not? Well, you know, and Second Life continues to add features allowing you to do that now. Although still, it's pretty, it's pretty out there, you know. Second Life does not feel like Facebook from a you are who you really are perspective. Um, so yeah, we started more that way just because I thought it was just fantastic and we thought it was fantastic and moving to see us become new people. Um, yeah. Just to note an interesting part of, of Second Life culture, when you have a conversation like this, I don't know if you all can see, but people in the audience are actually making questions and comments that you'll see appear on the left briefly as they're typing them in. And, and, and Jenna or someone in Second Life later on, we can look at the history and when we're in the small groups later, I can pull up some of those questions and try and, and respond to them. Um, uh, you're about to time out, Phil, on your computer. Done. Done, Fixed. He, he did it. Um, but, <laughs> but, and this back and forth between the virtual and the physical is something that's really fascinating. Okay. Just to show in terms of these questions of, of, of reality but also of ethics, if I click on my profile here inside of Second Life, one thing I did in terms of my research is that it says right here on the first sentence, it's a little small, my name is Tom Belstorff and I'm studying the cultures in Second Life because as a researcher, I wanted people to know who I was and I wanted people to know that um, I, I was a researcher studying Second Life. And often there's this fantasy in doing research that the researcher is a contaminant that's gonna ruin stuff by being there and couldn't you be invisible and a fly on the wall, wouldn't that be so awesome? And for the kind of research I do as an ethnographer studying culture, you want to participate in the culture. I wanted to build that house and have come people look at it and go dance at a disco and buy some nice clothes or do whatever, just like I do in my Indonesia research because I subscribe as a field worker to a vision of science in which the scientist is not a contaminant. And that fantasy of a God's eye view of the world is actually a way that domination and oppression can happen. And that a very powerful ethical move to make as a researcher, as an ethnographer, is that you are participating and you, you know who you, you say who you are to people. You don't hide that. And in my experience in Second Life, uh, doing you know, years of research in Second Life, people are tripping out on this. They would want to talk about it. I had my, in, my research in, in Second Life was so easy and so much fun that I'd have people IMing <laughs> me saying, why won't you interview me? I had a, a list. How come you've only interviewed me once? I just found this awesome thing I have to show you. I mean, it was the easiest research I've ever done yeah. because when people know you respect them and that you're not there to make fun or to be critical, but you really want to learn, they want to, in my experience, they want to share. And to be a participant observer, as, as, as Kamara is saying there, is a very powerful research method, I think. And, and I really tried to show that it can work for these virtual world spaces as well. You know, people often hear about what's sometimes called griefing, you know, or hacking, negative behavior, people stealing stuff. Places like Second Life have incredible amounts of kindness and altruism and people helping each other and supporting each other. You know, there's a very interesting transgender resource center in Second Life and cases of people who've gone into Second Life to try and see what it feels like to be a different gender and then use that to help them make a decision about gender transition, for right. instance. Um, there's, there's incredible work that happens in Second Life. Then there's people who go to have fun and play a game. I mean, it's 
it's whatever. But um, I would really encourage to not rush to judgment to see any technology, including virtual worlds, as immediately an evil, bad thing in the people who do it as, as, as you know, losers or whatever, because these technologies have incredible new power, and the sooner that we figure out how they work and what their possible benefits are, the better we can turn them to, to better humanity. I mean, the, I, one thing, amazing thing that Philip has done here that I've already used and other people have as well is instead of flying on a plane all the time. I actually did that for today, but I've had many meetings. Actually, this next week, I'm speaking to, I think, three different university classes about my book. That would be a lot of ozone, a lot of air pollution, but I'm doing it through Second Life, right? And avatars do have an energy cost, but it's much less than a physical a body on, a air, on an airplane, right? Yeah. And, it, and so that's, you know, there are these interesting possibilities with these spaces. Yeah, it's interesting for the people who haven't tried it, and I, I remember somebody chatting earlier from Second Life saying you kind of have to experience it to understand it, that there is a difficulty in having these conversations when you've not been in the virtual world, because there is an odd thing that happens with avatars and projection and identity that, of course, we're sort of uh, uh, meditating on here uh, beyond the, the basic fact of it. The strange thing about virtual worlds, and one of the things that makes them so compelling, when they have the right set of properties, and Second Life certainly does, is that you actually are projecting your body identity and taking a bunch of kind of very real-time neurological identity from the vision of the avatar. And that's a very unusual thing that you have to try to explain. I can give you a simple example of kind of where this all... I mean, basically what happens is, for example, if you, as Tom said, if you are very male in your real life and you... you try to use a female avatar in Second Life for a while, it is a very interesting feeling to do that. Very different than what you might think. You might imagine that it's almost playful, like, yes, I can just, it's like picking a Monopoly piece. I'll just be female. Uh, it's not that way at all. Um, because what happens is your brain actually projects you in much the same way when you're holding a cane and you touch the street, you sort of feel that cane as if it were a part of your body. You feel your avatar as if it were a part of your body. So you, you, you can have some incredible experiences with identity um, walking around in an avatar that looks different than you. It's an almost uh, uh, dizzying kind of a thing sometimes. There's an experiment uh, done in, uh, the, some European researchers have done something that I think we're ultimately going to get to with things like the Connect and all these neat interface devices that people are working with now where, where you can actually show somebody an avatar's arm in front of them and if you make that arm move like their real arm does enough, and you do the right sort of researchy things to make this magic happen, you can then like take a feather in the virtual world and touch the avatar's arm, and the individual will feel it directly, as if they were actually being contacted on their skin, though they're not. And that's because of our brain's amazing ability to essentially kind of project itself into these identities. So that really colors the and deepens the meaning of a lot of what we're talking about today. So for those who haven't seen this, know that it's kind of a, I guess, a stranger thing than you might think. Well, and, and what's so interesting about that as well is actually when the first virtual world was created in the early 1970s, an accident happened where they were playing with technologies like this. Two researchers in Maryland projecting a waveform. Myron Kruger was one of them. And they had two hands, they're each of their hands pointing at this like radio wave. And one of the researchers moved his hand down and the other guy yanked his finger back as if he was going to get touched. And that led to this aha moment for Myron Kruger where he's like, wow, he thinks we're in the same place. This could lead to something. And to, to piggyback off of Philip's point, if you haven't been in Second Life, it can be a strange thing. But also, this helps us realize how our bodies matter in the physical world. If changing your avatar inside a Second Life really can change the way you think about yourself, and it can have those effects. Many people talk about that. That really shows you how your body in the physical world has consequences, and the way that we change it, that we modify it, has consequences. And I'm always very interested in both the differences that exist between virtual worlds and the physical worlds, physical world, but also these fascinating points of resonance, echoes, continuity, linkage, and so on. Because if you look at all the people in this room in, in, in the uh, metanomics in Second Life, <clears throat> these are all very smart people, I'm sure. <clears throat> we're all smart people, but we're, these are not all people who have PhDs in computer science or whatever. We're all just people that we go into Second Life. And the fact that a million people, or, and that in some of these virtual worlds, 30 million, 40 million people can go into them and figure out what's going on means that something is staying the same. Something is a, enough continuity that people can learn these spaces and move in them and, and, and act in them. And that feeds back to teach us something about what it means to have a body in the physical world. You know, Tom, 
Well, and, and let me ask the question here of Second Life as well, because you'll see people responding to us in chat. Um, how many people in the audience in Second Life, or can you guys, if, if you can say it in a few words, can you describe <coughs> if, if there's been anything, the impact of your avatar, the impact that being an avatar has had on how you uh, make yourself look in real life, your, your appearance in real life? Has, has being an avatar in Second Life had some effect on how you dress or how you sort of present yourself in real life. And then the question I'd say for you, Tom, is in your research, if, if you remember, tell us any stories that you remember about that. In other words, what is the impact of the virtual identity back on, on the real back, yeah. backwards onto your physical and identity? And so watch here on the left. Um, if anyone, you're going to see people in Second Life putting in some answers to that. <coughs> and also, um, Second Life audience, as you're also typing that in, another thing to type up that we can just watch out of curiosity, for those of you who are uh, <clears throat> willing to do so, just the country or the state that you're in right now, because I think it's interesting for people to see how many places people are coming from. So either or both of those questions, if you could just type in how it's That's changed, how you think about yourself in the physical world, and also if you could just say, okay, so we have someone from Minneapolis, someone from Germany, Nova Scotia, Seattle, Scotland, Denmark, Canada, Fire Island, New York, D.C., Illinois, New Hampshire, France, <laughs> um, Pacific Northwest. I mean, look at that. Yeah. So this room of people are coming together, but the interaction they have inside of Second Life they don't need to know where they're from. They don't need to know that they're in Denmark and in Washington State and in France. They're having a new social interaction in this virtual space, and that's what I was interested in studying, that I don't have to get on a plane and fly to Denmark and fly to France and fly to Seattle. They don't have to do it in order to interact. interact. So as a researcher, I didn't have to do that either. And that was a big part of what I was trying to study. And there are some interesting examples already of exactly what Philip was talking about. Particularly, for instance, I've known some people who have, um, <clears throat> who are on the autism spectrum or who have forms of um, agoraphobia. I knew a case of someone who came to me in Second Life one day and I could just, I could tell by their typing that they were in tears. And they said, I've been in my house for, I can't remember, I'm, I'm just, I'm giving you a general idea here. I've been in my house for the last four years, I have this phobia, I can't go outside. And today, for the first time in several years, I went down to the corner in the grocery store and bought groceries and walked home and didn't like fall down crying because I practiced over and over again in Second Life, in my Second Life house, going out of my Second Life house and going to a virtual grocery store and mm -hmm. coming home. And I did it over and over again, and that helped me figure out how I could do that in the physical world. And there are interesting, yeah. um, I mean, the US government is using this for rehabilitating veterans of wars. I mean, there's so many different things that are happening out there where things that happen in virtual worlds can have physical world consequences because this is virtual too. There's a powerful way in which this is virtual too. So that it's not all a complete break. There is virtual here in our room and studying this and thinking about this helps us think about this. That's why I did the there's research a, in the first place. There's a big question that I think is the subject of a broader discussion today, which is, as we become more and more able to adjust what we look like, our, our, our identity and what other people see us as, as we gain more and more ability to do that in the real world, which surely we're doing, uh, how, is, is that more or less uh, a real projection of our own identity. Mm -hmm. Like I think one of the greatest questions that I'm not going to say I know the answer to, I could certainly have lots of thoughts about it, I could talk about it for hours, is, is your second life avatar more, a more realistic portrayal of you than your body is? And it's not so simple a question as you might yeah. think. And it, I hope you're noticing people are making some amazing comments in the chat as we're, as we're talking. And yeah, what is more real? I mean, I know cases, once again, to give a, a without, in, in my research, I always pretend confidentiality and I never give out exact names or even identifying details. That's why I speak abstractly, because I protect confidentiality of my, my interlocutors. But I know a case of someone who was uh, born um, female um, and thought that she might be male and tried being the other gender in Second Life um, and realized that he thought that maybe he should have a sex change operation, that that was the, the case. And after spending some time in Second Life, actually felt that their avatar self was more real to them than their physical world self that felt like it wasn't the right body. 
and that their avatar body was actually more real for them. Now, I'm not saying that's true for everyone, of course, or even for all transgendered folks who spend time in second life in various ways. I don't, I'm not trying to generalize. I'm just giving an example to, to, to say that for many people, it's not such a clear distinction about what is more real. And that's actually why, if you ever read my book, you'll find I never once use the word real world to talk about this. I call it either the physical world or the actual world. Because when people type quickly in Second Life, they'll say RL or IRL for in Second <laughs> Life, there. for real life, just as a colloquialism. But if you spend time in Second Life and really learn about virtual worlds, they are real as well. They're just as real in their own way as what happens in the physical world because there's virtualness here as well. And we, we don't want to create an idea of a real world that doesn't have computers in it or doesn't have technology in it because technology is part of the human experience. That's why in my book I go back to the original Greek term techne, which was used in originally in the Greek myth of Prometheus, the giving of fire to humankind, right? And techne in Greek philosophy means craft or art the ability to change the world through craft. Like a, a fish can breathe underwater, a human can breathe underwater with a straw. That straw is techne. And, I, and the way that crafting and creating, or what in, in Linden Lab they would call user-generated content is so central to virtual worlds, that what makes virtual worlds unique in my analysis is that for the first time in human history, techne can take place inside of techne. You can have crafting inside of something that is already the product of human crafting. And that's something that's really trips me out, that's really fascinating. <laughs> but it teaches us something, I think, about the way that humans have been crafting. That's what makes us human, is that we craft. Techne is not exterior to the human, right? The Greeks really got that. Um, that techne is not exterior to the human. It is techne that makes us human. And in a way, virtual worlds just highlight that. They really make it obvious and clear and beat it into my head so that I can't miss the point that techne is part of being human. <clears throat> and just, we, do, we should do a time check. What's our time? So we have like five more minutes before we move on to the next um, segment. So we have five more minutes left, and so we can make a couple wrap-up comments, and then we have a second panel, and then we're gonna have a group discussion. And, and in, for the Second Life folks, in the group discussion, I'm gonna look at my history and, and try and, and participate. There's gonna be a second panel, and then there's gonna be a small group exercise here at the tables, and we're gonna do small group exercises in Second Life as well. That'll be around like three o'clock for those uh, Second Life time for people who can stay that long. Um, but so what, any sort of final comments? Because I was just making a point. Any sort of wrap-up comments about all of this that you want to make, Philip? Well, I, I do think, as you said, that there is increasingly, there are these moments in human history where we've gotten control as, as thinking people over the world around us in interesting different ways. We, we, you know, we figured out fire a long time ago, and <laughs> we built atomic bombs, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, some 50 years ago, uh, we now are at this point where, as you say, I'd, I'd reiterate that, that we, strangely enough, are now able to essentially build our world over again, given our own desires and rules. We're, we're essentially not replicating all the laws of physics. You can fly in Second Life, for example, which you can't practically do uh, very easily in, in the <laughs> physical world. <laughs> Uh, so we are getting to rebuild the world again with our own rules. And the, the, the heady questions of what we're going to do as that happens are, are important ones. And if you, think that, if you think that this stuff doesn't matter or it's just a passing phase, think again. Because technology is not stoppable, um, or at least all of human history has shown it not to be thus far. And we are going to continue to create places that are increasingly more and more relevant and meaningful to us in the digital world. Uh, I believe that in many ways, um, in the next few years, we'll see these digital worlds that you're looking at the very beginnings of here with Second Life becoming, uh, for many, many realms of human experience, primary. That is to say, there are many things like art that we will probably do in ways in the virtual world which will simply be the first and most important place in which we experience those things. We, we actually won't be able to do them and won't even be interested in doing them anymore in the real world. Um, and, I, and I think that that is a heavy thought, uh, you know, for everybody. Thank you so much. So, um, before we move into part two, I wanted to thank Philip.
and Tom, and also thank uh, Chris Collin of Tipidean Technologies, who joined us today as our cameraman, and I think will continue to stay on. And Philip and Tom will <clears throat> continue, will stay with us, and will join us in discussion. And I believe um, some of our Second Life participants, thank you all for participating in Second Life as well, will be hopefully staying to, to join us in having these uh, smaller group discussions in our on-site experiment um, to bridge the two worlds. And so part two, so hold, hold these ideas in your head, and I know it's a lot. So um, rather than doing the q and I want to um, suggest that if you have any questions, to write it down and to hold on to it, because the way we've designed this is in two parts. This is important, and there's lots of questions to be um, asked around it, but also I wanted to uh, bring it together with Michelle T and Amos um, so that we can think about it potentially in that way. So hold on to that. But also, um, this is part two. Um, part two explores gender and sexuality, and we're going to have Michelle T, um, author of Valencia and founder of Radar Productions and Sister Spit, interviewing Amos Mack, who is the founder and editor of Original Plumbing the SF-based magazine dedicated to exploring the sexuality and culture of FTM transgendered men. So it, very soon we're gonna be setting up, right? Yeah, like we just need two minutes. And in that time, please customize yourselves and move your bodies <laughs> around because your brains will work better when you eat, when you move, when you do things, but get back quickly <laughs> so we can get Amos and Michelle. <laughs> 